You'd think because it has Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and Flight of Icarus, it'd be number one, but it's not. What's up? Welcome back to the Metalhead Car Show. I've ranked Iron Maiden studio albums, the intro tracks, the closing tracks, but today we rank the live albums. With 11 full length of live albums stretching over almost a 50 year career, there's a lot to pick from. So today we're gonna dive into and rank the live Iron Maiden albums. Before we get into it, I'm only ranking albums that Iron Maiden released. So things like Live in Tel Aviv, uh, somewhere in Paris, those aren't going to count, and we're only going to be ranking the full-length album, so things like Made in Japan is also out. So, let's get right into it. Starting off in 11th place and coming out in 1993 with A Real Live Dead One. Now this probably isn't a big shocker, A Real Live Dead One I don't think is anyone's favorite album. A Real Live Dead One's kind of plagued with kind of a okay at best production quality, and it's kind of known that on the course of the Real Live One tour, Bruce really wasn't trying. Now he may have been trying on this album, but you can find lots of footage during the tour where when they're opening with Be Quick or Be Dead, Bruce just kind of missed the intro scream, walk on stage, and just start singing as if it didn't matter. But that wasn't on the album, and the album is what we're looking at. So despite it has a Bruce Dickinson that's not at its peak and a crude production quality, it does have some benefits to it. Now in 1992, Iron Maiden did the Fear of the Dark tour, so the real live one tour was going to be kind of a continuation of that, still having all the Fear of the Dark songs they were playing of the year prior, but with a lot of tweaks to the set list. Adding in songs like Transylvania, Where Eagles Dare, Remember Tomorrow, name a few. Bruce wanted to play songs that he felt after he quit Iron Maiden wouldn't be played again. And funny enough, outside of Transylvania, those have all been pulled out. <laughs> so having those songs along with some of the 90s songs like Tail Gunner, Freight Shoot Strangers, and From Here to Eternity is pretty cool. I can't give it anything higher than last place. In 10th place, Live at Donington. Now again, this one kind of had some of the same production issues that a Real Live Dead one had, but they're not as bad. I found a Real Live Dead one kind of sounded like trash. This album does sound good. It's just the guitar tones on this album, they, they suck, they're terrible. You wanna hear the best example of this? Go listen to Run to the Hills or The Clairvoyant. But with that said, this album does actually have a really lively audience to it. It is a good performance, and it actually has one really unique moment on the album. The last song of the set is Running Free, and one of the special things they did with this is they actually had Adrian Smith out on stage with them, having Bruce Dickinson, Steve Harris, Nick McBrain, Dave Murray, Yannick Gears, and Adrian Smith. The lineup we would have actually seen as of 1999. So seeing it then it was actually kind of cool. So it's not a terrible album, it has some cool moments on it, but I really can't put it any higher because the guitar tones really aren't good and the set list is very safe. New songs and hits, and that's it. And for a lot of people, that's be completely fine. No one's going to have a real problem with that. But having one or two surprise songs will push the album a lot further in my eyes. In ninth place, Beast Over Hammersmith. I love Beast Over Hammersmith. This album is awesome. Do not get me wrong. I think of every album on this list, it's probably the second most listened to album for me. For those who don't know, Beast Over Hammersmith was a live album Iron Maiden did in 1982 for the Beast on the Road tour. So you get a lot of Number of the Beast on here, including Total Eclipse, and Killers, and Drifters, and Another Life, and Murders in the Room Morgue, and Phantom of the Opera. There's a lot of good shit on this album. And it's the only full length album to have Clive Burr drumming on it. So why is it going farther down the list? Despite the this album has so much energy to it and an awesome set list, the production is trash. <laughs> To some people, that won't matter and it's gonna sound like me just bitching, but honestly, it's a big deal. If the production quality is garbage, the album's not gonna be as enjoyable to listen to. You're gonna hear that complaint once or twice more, but it's fizzling out, I promise. Eighth place, Maiden England. So Maiden England was a live album from Iron Maiden's seventh tour of the seventh tour, supporting the seventh son of the seventh son. And frankly, this album's awesome. The set list was so daring for its time. I know that a lot of these songs were eventually pulled back out, but dropping Two Minutes of Midnight, dropping The Trooper, dropping Rap Child, but instead playing Still Life, instead playing Killers, instead playing some newer material from the Summer and Time album. This was generally a ballsy set list to do. But frankly, I don't really go back to this album that often. And 
I think it's because of Bruce. Now Bruce didn't sound bad, but he almost sounded like he may have been sick during this show, which that's gonna come up again very soon actually. And he just wasn't on his A game, which is a real shame because this is a wicked album. And despite it doesn't quite have the quality of some of the other albums, the quality is actually really good for its time. I think it's generally better than the Live Donington album, which came out like three years later. So it's not the best live album, but it's damn good. In seventh place in the first modern album, but Knights of the Living Dead. So Knights of the Living Dead has kind of a weird history to it. Because frankly, I don't think this album was ever supposed to exist. Baden released it in early 2021, and I think they only released it because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Sounds weird, but hear me out. The Legacy of the Beast tour was supposed to end in 2020. That tour got postponed to 2021, and even in 2021, the plan was to actually start weaving in some Sinjetsu songs. Because in 2021, Sinjetsu was supposed to come out. So since the Legacy of the Beast tour didn't get to properly finish the way they wanted it to, they didn't release Sinjetsu, and because they didn't release Sinjetsu, they actually had to release something for their label, so they released this. So because of that, I think there's a little bit less preparation towards it, and that kind of shows in Bruce. It was well known that in 2019, Bruce really wasn't doing well on that tour. So during the entirety of the North American tour, Bruce is actually in a lot of pain during the entire tour, which is why he wasn't jumping around or doing anything completely sporadic. I think it was something along the lines of the, he broke a hip and he was kind of dealing with that the entire tour, but he did push through it. Unfortunately, by the time he got to South America, he got sick. So I know just a few years prior, he was dealing with throat and tongue cancer. The fact that he came back from that as a singer is wild to me, but that mixed with him simply being sick on this tour really kind of took a beating on him. Amazingly, he still sounds great. He actually really does sound good, but it was still there. If you really want to see it at full force, go watch the 2019 Rock and Rio footage. But Bruce aside, the Legacy of the Beast tour had a awesome set list. It was the first time they pulled out some Blaze Bailey songs since the Death on the Road tour. It was the first time playing a Matter of Life and Death song since 2010. And we got other songs like Ace is High, Where Eagles Dare, and Flight of Icarus. Only thing I would change, drop Fear of the Dark, replace Fear of the Dark with How Be I Name, replace How Be I Name with To Tame a Land. This tour was the unofficial 35th anniversary tour for Peace of Mind, and I always felt that was the one song that was missing. So maybe if Bruce is feeling better, and maybe the one little song change happened, this could be the best live album they ever did. But almost primarily due to Bruce's performance, it's unfortunately not. In sixth place, the live chapter. Now the live chapter is filmed on the 2016 and 2017 Book of Souls tour. Now I think they did this because they were actually having some legal issues with How Bad Name at the time. So doing the 2017 set list, which didn't have How Bad Name in it, probably would have been a safer move for them. They also swapped Tears of a Clown for The Great Unknown, which pretty great swap in my mind. But anyway, I've always found that to be a really cool, unique tour. It was in support of the Book of Souls album, which is actually a really good kind of overlooked album, in my opinion. But along with that, it had Children of the Damned on it. It had Power Slave on it. It also has like one of the most unorthodox encores of any Maiden setlist I've seen, being Number of the Beast, Blood Brothers, and Wasted Years. It also holds kind of a little special thing for me because I was actually at one of the shows on this album. I was at the Montreal show, which they used the uh, Children of the Damned audio from. So it had a little extra bit. But it's going a little bit lower down because this is right after Bruce's surgery. The fact that he did this tour at all is super impressive. But it was right after the surgery, so he wasn't 100%, so I can't really put it any higher. In fifth place, and one that's kind of really dear to my heart, En Vivo. So En Vivo was recorded in 2011 on the Final Frontier Tour in Chile. It has a 55,000 person audience that are all super active. It was in support of the Final Frontier album, which this is the only live album you can find Final Frontier songs on. And it has just a really tight performance. It's a little bit near and dear to me because as a Canadian, the 2011 leg of the Final Frontier tour never came here. And I actually drove to Tampa, Florida to see Iron Maiden do this show on my birthday. So being able to say I saw the show, well, different show, but I saw that set list 
and getting to go back and hear the live album of it is kind of a really special thing for me. So of every album on this list that holds the most amount of nostalgia to me, but I can't really pull up because it's a extremely safe set list. Now, yeah, there is Dance of Death, there is Wicker Man, there is Blood Brothers, I get it, they're great, but I think it needs that one more song. I don't know if that's something for a matter of like death, I don't know if that's just some weirdo from the 80s, but it needs that one little extra something. Nonetheless, awesome and truly one of my favorites, but I'm not putting it at the top. In fourth place, Live After Death. I don't think I really need to explain Live After Death that much. It's Live After Death, it's a bad live album. For those who don't know, Live After Death was the live album from the Power Slave Tour, the Our World Slavery Tour. And it was essentially nothing but Power Slave, Peace of Mind, and Number of the Beast with the addition of Iron Maiden. And if you got one of the extended albums, it came out with Rap Child, Die With Your Boots On, Two Minutes in Midnight, Phantom of the Opera, Children of the Damned, I think there's one version with Lost for Words. My only kind of complaints with this album is the production is not 100% there. Bruce is still kind of just wailing around with his voice, which is what you kind of see from a lot of younger, really talented singers. And it kind of wasn't the full show. Now, yes, if you went to that show, you'd say I'm wrong. That's every song they played, and you are correct. But for the North American tour, they actually cut down the set list by like four songs. And I think he's just missing that a little bit. If you look at some of the really early set lists from that tour, you'll find like Back in the Village and Flash the Blade on there, which would be super cool to hear live. It's a great show. It's a great set list. It's a great album. I just think there's better. Third place, Death on the Road. Death on the Road has to be one of the ballsiest and just kind of coolest set lists I've ever seen. Using two long brand new songs being Passchendaele and Dance of Death, opening the encore of Journeyman, while still incorporating songs like Lord of the Flies, Can I Play With Madness, and Brave New World into the set list. This was such a huge move, and it was actually a really cool time for Maiden. Off topic, but I'll get back to it. Around this time, Maiden wasn't 100% sure how much longer they had and how much relevance they had left, but it was the Dance Death Tour where they started to see a huge amount of younger people come out and just some of the best numbers they've ever seen from shows before which kind of solidified their future. Anyway, back to the album. So this album has a stellar performance from absolutely everyone, especially Dave Murray. I have to give him kind of the, the crown of the show. And I think it has one of the best performances of Hell Behind Name I've ever heard. I go back to this album pretty frequently and truthfully, I don't really have anything bad to say about it. Like I don't love the actual video production of it, but we're not really looking at the video production for this video. We're just looking at the album. So I'm not gonna judge that, but it's a great album. The only reason it's not number one is I just like the next two more. So in second place, and by saying second place, it also says what first place is, but second place, Rock and Rio. Rock and Rio was such a awesome goddamn show. It had the band at what sounded like its heaviest for a lot of the songs. It had the band at just full goddamn power. Bruce sounded amazing and super aggressive on it. And it has this kind of really unique moment with Two Minutes Midnight. This is the only live album from the 2000s and up that has Yannick Gears doing the intro to Two Minutes Midnight. What's the difference? Well, this. <laughs> It's an awesome album. It's actually also the only time on the primary Brave New World tour that actually played Run to the Hills on the tour, extending their encore a little bit. It's a phenomenal album. But why isn't it in first place? Despite, I think the show is awesome. The band did an incredible job and actually has the song that got me into metal on it. I think the set list is very safe. Now there's some shows on the Brave New World tour where they actually had an extended encore of Fallen Angel and Out of the Silent Planet. And if they pulled that set list out, which they did like a few days prior in, I think, Argentina or Chile, it would probably be number one. Is that a small thing? Of course it's a small thing, but when we're getting to really, really good albums, we're looking at the small things. Awesome album. I think of any album on this list, it's probably the first album I go listen to, but it just doesn't really top Flight 666 for me. 
Flight 666 came out in 2009 using live audio from the 2008 Somewhere Back in Time tour. At this point, kind of like the legendary Iron Maiden tour, they pulled out Ed Force One for the first time, they pulled out Agent Mariner for the first time since 1987. Like, it's super cool. This is also the first professionally recorded a uh, retrospective tour Iron Maid never did because they're actually touring on the Power Slave album whilst actually doing the Summer Back in Time tour. Now I know they were also looking at Peace of Mind and Summer in Time and Seven Sun, Seven Sun all at the same time doing this, but based on the stage and the set list using four songs from Power Slave being Aces High, Two Minutes Midnight, Power Slave, and Rhyme Beach and Mariner, it was very much the Power Slave tour. And it's the only time to date, we've heard all three guitars do Rhyme and Agent Mariner. Dave Murray gives out an absolute ripping guitar solo in Agent Mariner. And I don't have a single bad thing to say about it. Like, yeah, we got a lot of these songs on the older albums, but the production's higher on this. The guitar tones are fixed. Like, go listen to the intro from Run to the Hills from Live at Donington. And now check it out for Flight 666. We also got a lot of South American dates, a lot of countries that haven't ever seen Maiden before. So there's so much excitement over a lot of these songs. I kind of now see this set list as a bit of a basic set list, but frankly, this is the set list that's gonna get so many people going and thrilled with the show. And I will never ignore that. So because it has a great production, everyone's on their A game, the crowds are amazing. And it has just a really kind of diverse, cool set list, still using songs like Ancient Mariner, Moonchild, and Heaven Can Wait, I'm placing Flight 66 at number one. But I want to know, what do you think? How would you rank Iron Maiden's live albums, and do you agree with me? Let me know in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. Like, subscribe if you enjoyed what you've seen. I tend to post on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, and I'll see you later.